May I now request Professor S. N. Balagangadhara from Ghent University, Belgium, to kindly make his presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to try an experiment now. Uh, today we have people. I feel sorry Chinese are not here. Japanese, Cambodia, Mongolia, and so on. Let me begin by addressing them. You see, about one and a half thousand to two thousand years ago, my ancestors came and met your ancestors. Maybe it was Bodhidharma. Maybe it was Nagarjuna. It doesn't matter. My ancestor. They spoke to you individually and asked your ancestors to give them a hearing. So my ancestors said, give, us, give, me, give, us, give me, give us a hearing. It's actually individuals who went there. Give me a hearing. If you find what I'm saying interesting or useful, take it. If you don't find it interesting, useful or good, throw it. Well, why do I tell you this? Today, a descendant is standing in front of you of these ancestors of mine. He's asking you the same thing. Give me a hearing. Take it if you find it interesting, useful, good. Otherwise, throw it. But you owe it to your ancestors to give me a hearing because they did it also. So this is how I would address people from Cambodia, Myanmar, Mongolia, Tibet, and so on. Why is this important, you ask? You see, there's something extraordinary, which in a way has been vaguely touched upon here, which is this. See, if you look at Europe, you found that you find, historically speaking, of course, that the spread of Christianity in the West was possible because of an organization, the Roman Catholic Church, enormous trade, military conquests. In short, it was a mammoth attempt over more than a thousand years to Christianize Europe. But if you look at Asia, Asia, something extraordinary. One Chandra Kriti, one Nagarjuna, I don't know, they, they, they even went abroad. One or two bhikkhus traveled. Some Indians went, individuals. No trade. I mean, there was, of course, trade. But tra these things didn't spread through trade. There was no church, there was no conquest. Hinduism went right up to the doors of Japan. Buddhism went beyond that. Why? What a simple answer. Is it possible that they resonated in these different cultures and societies because there really is something fundamental that unites us as Asia? You could resonate to the Buddha, I could resonate to Shankara, because Cambodia, in fact, is one of the places where you find tremendously beautiful documents. If they were not destroyed, either by the French or the Khmer Rouge, the Khmer Rouge. extraordinary documents about law, and so on and so forth. So, what made you resonate? What made your ancestors resonate? I think. There's something even deeper than Christian Christianity, which unites the Western culture, <laughs> unites us. And I want to appeal to that. I'm, I'm going to speak to you about that. One of the speakers warned you that I'm rebellious. Actually, I'm not. I'm an old man, 63 years old, for heaven's sake. You're a rebel when you're 18 years old. Well, I did. I smoked, I drink, I still continue to do so. But not now. 
too old to rap. Actually, I'm a very nice chap, but people don't believe that. Still. I truly, truly, I'm a very nice guy. So I just want to tell you two, three things. I have exactly five minutes left. And there's one good thing of being in Europe, you know? You stick to time. 10 minutes means 10 minutes. I'll please you. I'll please you. <laughs> one thing. A couple of things, actually. Three things I'll tell you. First, this is a result of 40 years of, of my research in Europe. And my research, I'll just tell you the theme, is to describe Western culture against the background of Indian culture. That is, it's how I started. It's become Asian by now. How does the West, Western culture, appear to us? We know how it appears. You know, we have the Opelican books and Penguin books about Reformation, about Enlightenment, about Renaissance. There was this glorious Newton. There was the inglorious Karl Marx. Fine. We see, this is the propaganda department of the Western culture. I just told us the story. And unfortunately, all of us repeat it, mimic it, mindlessly. I discovered we don't know Europe at all. And then this guy something even stranger was doing my research. I didn't know India either. Because what I learned about India, what we're teaching in our universities, what Japanese are doing, Chinese are doing, there's no difference. But I speak only about India so that my uh, Japanese friends don't get uh, insulted. Because there's no problem insulting Indians. I mean, they'll insult me back. But you're the guests here, so I mean, uh, so I, I won't insult you. So what we do in India, that's why I only speak about India, but please, it refers to the undertext, subtext is, Europe, uh, is Asia. We reproduce European stories. No, nothing wrong with it, you say. Look, we also reproduce their physics, chemistry, mathematics, technology, and so on. It's absolutely true. I have nothing against the Europeans. I mean, my wife is a European, my children are Europeans, my students are Europeans, I have nothing against them. But the thing is this. The secular theories of today, secular meaning science, so-called scientific theories, be it in political science, be it in sociology, be it in law, they are secularizations of Christianity. That is to say, I was listening to all of you rather carefully too. Let me tell you something very true. All of you are Christians. Did you know that? Which means one good thing, eh? Your souls are saved. <laughs> truly, truly, truly. I mean, I'm not one. I'll never become one. I have a, I have a very, very uh, special seat, hot seat reserved in the hell I'm too old. Fine. <laughs> no problems with that. But you're not Christians. You ask why. I have exactly two minutes. <laughs> so if you want to know more, please read what I have written. Give me a hearing. Please read it. He said, we talked, we have been talking here. All of us talked today, including the Honorable Prime Minister, who is also a Christian, by the way, and I'll tell you how. We talk about needy creatures that human beings are. Right? We all have basic needs, isn't it? Well, I think it's true. I'm going to take a bet on it. In all Asian languages as well, but in Indian, Indian languages, we don't have the word, we don't know what it means. We use the word desire. So if we say desire, it's also interesting. We talk about we have multiple desires, no? hundreds, thousands, millions of desires, infinite desires. Indian traditions say the following. We don't have multiple desires. What we have is one single desire. Now, what does it do? It latches on, clings. To what? To everything. And I think this is what Buddha was talking about when he spoke of grasping. He didn't say, who grasps? You can't ask that question in Buddha or even in Indian traditions. In fact, grasping, he said, is a problem. What is it? Desire attaching itself. Now to Galaxy S6 Edge tomorrow morning, Mizu telephones, or even 
one plus two, for which you have to be invited if you want to buy the food. <laughs> but one good thing about the Chinese, they are like Indians, they sell everything in black market. I bought it in Europe, black market. That's a good thing about all Asians. I don't know how the Japanese are. I think they're also corrupt, like Indians are. But it's good. You see, probably that's why you resonated to the Buddha. And that's why you reproduced the Buddha. In any case, so this notion of human being, desire, the Bible, it's all, only in the Bible, meaning Old and New Testaments. And he says, look, human beings have conflicts, desire conflict, no? So because of this, there are conflicts between human beings. Indian traditions say there's only one desire. There is no conflict in a human being. Therefore, there are no conflict between human beings. It's not possible. If there is, it's because you're ignorant about the nature of desire, about who you are. So like this, we develop a thought, which is the complete opposite of what is called scientific theories today in social sciences. For about 35 years, we've been arguing the following. Social sciences are not sciences at all, they're ideologies. We have to build a social science, and I truly believe 40 years of research that is going to come from Asia. It won't come from Europe for hundreds of reasons. So if you feel like listening to it, invite me to your college and we will talk for about three months or something. So you'll understand all the arguments. But for the time being, the excellencies, when I bring my books, when I revered masters, I just want to say one thing. If you want to carry what you're trying to do today forward, you need three fundamental things which I don't discover here. One, you must know the Western culture well. If you don't, keep it. Second, don't reproduce Buddha or Shankara or Brahma Sutra Bhasha here. Nobody will understand it. Nobody. Your children don't give a damn whether you have an Atma or there is an Atma. So talk to them in this language, to the youth of today. You're going to lose them. If you genuinely believe that these traditions are something to say to us today in the 21st century, which I believe, say it in the language of today. If they are raising important questions, giving us good solutions, it must be possible to say in our language, 21st century language, what it is. And this is my belief. We, Asians, are the only ones who developed social science, human sciences, 2,000 years ago. Second thing you have to do. Third, love is all well and good. You know, Christ has shown the other cheek and Buddha's compassion. Uh, show it. But don't forget one thing, that if people err, they need to be punished. So if you're a loving father, you punish the child if it's not learning well. Well, there is a relationship we should have towards Christian, Jewish, Muslim religions and Western culture. You don't have the three. My earnest, very humble request to you is this. Shut up the conference. If you can't do any of the three properly. I have said, thank you very much. May I now request our guest of honor, His Excellency Sri Kripa Sur Sherpa, Honorable Minister for Culture, Tourism and Civil Aviation, Government of Nepal. I am very honored to have this opportunity to share a few words at this program. Global Hindu Buddhist Initiative on Conflict, Awareness and Environment Consciousness. First of all, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to Vivekananda International Foundation, India for organizing this program and also for inviting me to be a part of this important occasion in this historical and beautiful city. This session also go to international Buddhist community and seem to have been undermined. Never before have the human life been 
exposed to challenge and the problem caused by the conflict and the such more conflict at such level. Likewise, we are confronted with worrying level of impact of environmental degradation throughout the globe. No region of the world is unaffected by the adverse impact of global climate change. Whether it is the foreign a region of high mountains, or it is a plain, plain area of the lowlands, whether it is the interior land or it is the coastal land joined with ocean. All areas of this earth and lives there we have come under the direct threat of the negative impact of climate change. We all know Hinduism and the Buddhism are the most ancient religion of the world. They carry long time-tested traditions and influence the way of life of millions of people in Asia. Asia. In fact, the meaning of both Hinduism and Buddhism is not limited to the restricted notion of reason, religion. They are in real sense the philosophies of human life hence the way of life. Both Hinduism and Buddhism are directly concerned with the central thought of communities. It is also in this context that the title of the program Hindu with the initiative on conflict avoidance and environmental consciousness carries truly meaningful relevance. It is we understood that the philosophy of Buddha is entirely associated with the philosophy of non-violence. With truth and uh, uh, compassion to all animals we, which are core element of humanity. Likewise, we all know that Hinduism derives its philosophy from nature, from humanity and Hindu. In Hinduism, nature is regarded as God. The sun, the moon, the sky, the air, the river and earth are to say each and every part of nature is considered as one or another from the God from the God. Nature is revered. It is also therefore that the amalgamation of these two tradition philosophy may prove crucial and avoiding conflict and preserving nature. We highly value the importance of peace tolerance and the understanding for avoiding conflict. We believe in non-violence. In Buddha, we believe that he, this is an approach, a principle, a philosophy, as well as a way of life. It has been the most desirable and effective means of social and political change as well. Great leaders of the world have pursued the principle of non-violence in their movements for social and political change. The nature and the magnitude of such accomplishment handed over to us by Lord Buddha, Mahatma Gandhi and uh, Martin Luther King have inspired people across the world. We are equally concerned about climate change and uh, its negative impact on the planet. No reason, no lives are, are immune from this. The negative impact of climate change is even deeper in our region of South Asia, especially in a mountainous region and the coastal region, which might be badly affected by the increasing temperature, the melting of ice in the Himalayas, the re reduction in the agro production, the negative impact on biological diversity and the advance, adverse effect on public health, the increase in natural disaster, the problem in food security are some of the challenges we, which we are uh, prone to. 
to conclude the objective of the avoidance of conflict and environmental consciousness, consciousness can be achieved only if we understand and accept the existence of others, if we are able to subside our ego, which obtain and by nature reject the others, if we love our mother nature and protect it for the future generation, true understanding of deep philosophy of humanism, Hinduism and Buddhism and their implementation in real life situation are what we need today and I am sure this program and the outcome of this deliberation will guide us in that direction. Thank you.